Project C-1000 Future Submarine Program, Short Fin Barracuda Block 1A. Subbrief. All right, so we're going to begin our story in 2009. A quick footnote here. The uh, program officially begins in 2007 when Australia formally realizes they need to begin a program to replace the Collins class submarine. So that aside, we're starting our story in 2009 when things actually get rolling. So imagine Australia in 2009, your Labor Party Minister of Defense is Joel Fitzgibbon. And here is the world Joel lives in. This is the 2009 world situation, and he's responsible for defending Australia. China is rising as a globe power, global power, as expected in the 21st century. And there are conservative estimates that they will rival even the United States on the economic uh, battlefield by 2030. And they will certainly be the dominant regional power in the this part of the Pacific, the area between Japan and Australia. And they're going to have more ships than both those nations. Uh, they have a very large, China has a very large shoreline, and they're developing a lot of other systems that uh, include, you know, missile systems, air systems, satellite systems, cyber warfare is a big part of a Chinese national strategy. Uh, they want to interrupt the flow of communication before the first shot is fired. That is China's um, take on warfare in the 21st century. India is becoming a dominant regional power. Now, India and Pakistan have gone back and forth over who has the uh, dominant Navy in the Indian Ocean for decades. And that power pendulum has swung back and forth. But clearly, India is moving in, you know, a, a new direction with their uh, submarines from Russia that are on lease, uh, their ballistic missile submarine with ICBMs on it, and uh, they're growing their Navy. They also have a large number of bases, as you can see here on the map, uh, that are outside Indian territory, down in Madagascar, the Mirantes, and uh, islands off the coast of Somalia. Again, monitoring, monitoring pirate activity. Uh, the United States is leasing a large uh, U.S. naval base there at Diego Garcia. Uh, piracy is increasing in the South Pacific uh, and in the Indian Ocean. It's seen a significant increase since 2000 and continues to grow. So this is something Australia will have to contend with with in partnership or coalition with other uh, nation states in the region, like India, Pakistan, um, Japan to some sort, even though they're kind of far away. And uh, there's a global depression going on. That's right. The uh, housing crisis that in America cascaded the markets around the globe into a, a free fall because they were all overvalued based on junk bonds and other junk securities. Um, that's, that's a whole brief in and of itself right there. Uh, the uh, global depression and what kicked that off. But the result is in 2009, the globe is in a global depression. And so there isn't a lot of money in the coffers coming in in 2009, 2010 to pay for any future programs. Yet he is responsible for building what is known in 2009 as Force 2030. It should be a balanced, capable force of meeting every contingency. And that is no small order considering the world Mr. Joel Fitzgibbon faces. Defense of White Paper 2009 is published. It is quoted as saying, defense planning decisions made in this decade will affect Australia for decades to come. This is the gravity of the decisions we are about to make over the next 10 years, that we'll be determining the cost and military position of the nation, Australia, for the 21st century. And we were making these decisions now and there will be repercussions for decades afterwards. Generations of Australians, some of whom are not even born yet, will be reaping the benefits and paying the cost of these decisions. So these decisions are not made lightly by anyone. And this defensive white paper puts that out in the forward. They, Australia should establish a level of resources needed for future defense. We need to know how much it's going to cost. And it's not just about money. It's about manpower and infrastructure and political influence, political infighting. You know, what is it going to take to get a future defense that's effective? We should not spend less than is prudent to dictate 
or in, influence our strategic outlook. In other words, we should not shrink our strategic outlook to save some money and reduce our defensive capability, our military capability. We should create a strategic outlook that is best for Australia and then determine the cost and then resolve to pay that cost. They don't want to let cost dictate a strategic outlook. And this is a very defensive uh, defense department way of looking at strategy because uh, it's a very practical way. You know, you can save some money and lose the war and you lose your nation. Well, that's unacceptable. They must have a strategic outlook that prevents that. The way they're going to do that is they're continue the strategy of controlling air and sea approaches to Australia. Australian is a continental nation. You know, it's surrounded by water. And so they've done a great job till now controlling the sea and air approaches since World War II and defending the nation. So they're going to continue that strategy. Regional stability is a big part of that because if uh, bad actors, uh, we don't want to name any country, but if a country wanted to attack Australia, one of the easiest ways to do this would be to create a staging area within strike range of, Aus of Australia. Well, Australia is surrounded by a number of uh, other countries and islands. Uh, whether it's Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, uh, East Timor is a rather small country that has had some instability recently. And New Zealand and Australia and a coalition of other countries in the region have supported East Timor with uh, money and military to help uh, keep that small country stable. Because if it falls into anarchy and instability, a la Libya, then that could be used as a staging area for attacks on Australia. They're also going to continue their global coalition support for military operations around the world. And I have been privileged to witness a few of these, whether it was uh, their support in Afghanistan and Iraq on the ground or in naval war games in the Pacific, uh, where they always participate and perform professionally and very capably too. Uh, part of this DWP, this defensive white paper is to replace the Collins class submarine with a more capable future submarine and the uh, air warfare defense frigate with a future frigate. So we have future sub and future frigate. Uh, the third thing that they're going to recommend is that we require, Australia requires a fifth generation multi-role fighter, you know, something like the F-35 or something like that. Now, today's sub brief is going to focus on the future submarine only, but this defensive white paper covers the entire spectrum of Australian defense. Enter Sean Castillo. Okay, so Sean Castillo is a former Royal Australian Navy officer, submarine qualified and served on board Collins class submarines in the past. So this man has military experience. He's, uh, he's out of the Navy now serving the Australian Submarine Corporation as the executive general manager. All right, so he's in a civilian role now, still involved in submarine construction. ASC is the company that builds and maintains the Collins class submarine. Okay, so he's the executive general manager of that. In 2009, the same year that that defensive white paper is published, he publishes his own article called How to Buy a Submarine, you know, implying that ASC is probably going to be the one building it. We need to, uh, here's, here's how it's done from ASC's perspective or from Sean's perspective. He says, first, we have to have a fully designed submarine before we cut steel. We don't want to repeat the mistakes the Americans made with their Seawolf program, where they began building the Seawolf and then partway through the process changed some of the design that caused cost overruns and scheduling delays. So let's have a full design on paper sketched out permanently before we begin cutting the steel. That way we know exactly what we need, how much it's going to cost, how long it's going to take. Uh, this getting this full design is very important. Do not use unproven technology, Sean says. He says, let's get the best technology out there that is tested. We don't want to take a chance with the 21st century military defense of Australia with technologies that aren't proven yet. Use research and development programs in Germany and France and other countries around the world, but he names those two specifically, to save time and implying saving money. Because R&D of any new technology, whether it's military or not, can be very expensive and it can fail. You can spend a lot of time and money on something that does not work. So let's find these proven technologies that are already being developed by these other countries 
and pay them for the intellectual property and maybe incorporate them in the build process as well. This is already his line of thought. Integrate Australian Submarine Corporation, ASC, into the government's industrial capability. Now, this is kind of already done because they're maintaining the Collins class, but I believe he's just reiterating the importance of continuing ASC's involvement which would make sense considering his position as executive general manager and his history in the submarine fleet. The gap between building the Collins submarine and future submarine will require worker training. Now he's not talking about the military gap, which could easily happen. And we'll talk about that later on in the lecture. He's talking about the maintenance and skill set the shipyard workers have from building the Collins class, which happened years ago, decades ago. Uh, they've been just maintaining those boats, barely struggling to maintain them for a long time now. And now they're going to shift gears to not only maintaining them, but we're also going to start building a future submarine that's not designed yet. That's going to have all this new technology that we're not, we were not tooled for, and we don't know how to create, and we don't have the facilities to create it in. We, we have nothing. So we need to fill this gap. We need to uh, retrain the workers. We need to put in the infrastructure and invest the time and money it takes to build the submarine before we cut steel. Uh, he estimates at this very early stage that the per boat cost will be $550 million. I'm not sure what he based that on, but he does later on in his paper quote from the defense material organizations, uh, initial paper back in 2007 and eight, uh, that this future submarine project has an estimated constant dollar cost at 2009 of $36 billion over the life of the program. The life of the program estimating 30 years if you include the R&D years. The R&D is expected to take 10 years and then another five years of infrastructure on top of that for a total of 15 years. And then you spend the last 15 years of the 30-year window building submarines. That's what he's envisioning. And he gets a lot of it right. This is the budget for Australia in 2009 from the Defense of White Paper, Chapter 18, Paragraph 4, shows the whole country spends about $338 billion in the year of 2009, this is the global depression too, to finance the country. A small part of that is defense. You can see a relative pie slice to all the other programs going on in Australia as to what defense is. It's about $21 billion in 2009. So his constant uh, evaluation of $36 billion over 30 years is just a little bit over $1 billion a year for the next 30 years. It's a significant part of that $21 billion defense budget. But in 2015, uh, the budget is going to be increased to $50 billion constant dollars with an upturn, you know, calculated for inflation and uh, international finance exchange rates over the next couple of years in 2015, uh, it could be as high as $80 billion. Now we're not in 2015 yet, so we don't know it's $80 billion, but that could be the total cost of this program depending on how things go. Remember we're in 2009 and it's a depression. Okay, so let's begin with the first head of the future submarine program from the military side, Rear Admiral Rowan Moffat. So Rear Admiral Rowan Moffat takes the helm, and in 2009, he is the Senior Naval Officer of C-1000, Future Submarine Program. Remember, Future Submarine Program is only one part of the whole deals, but he's in charge of this one part. He leads the program for five years. In the first five years of the program, there's not a lot of tangible results, but he does a lot of very important work. One is seeing what kind of submarine market is out there. There's no official international submarine market where you can just go by your submarine, but there are countries who have a history of selling uh, technology, whether it's Russia, China, uh, you know, France and Germany, you know, countries out there that have sold their technology around the world. And in 2014, Japan for the first time makes it legal for Japan to export its military technology. So, so Japan is getting into the, into the game now as well. So he, not only catalogs what is important, he creates the framework of the future submarine program, sets the priorities, uh, begins what will eventually be the competitive evaluation process. He's responsible for laying the groundwork for all these things. What are going to be the phases? Well, there's going to be a, a design phase, of course. There's going to be a bidding phase. There is going to be a mobilization phase where we build infrastructure. And then we're going to see what systems are required for 
these submarines. That's its own phase. Well, he's spending these first five years laying all that out in a plan. So he does that for five years. 2014, he retires from the Navy and he has this wealth of knowledge. So he is hired by a company called EY, that's a defense contractor, in September 2014, where he is assigned uh, to the consulting firm EY Defense. EY is a huge company. EY Defense is a department of that company or part of that company. He's in charge of leading the bid to win the commercial services agreement for the competitive evaluation. Because of his inside knowledge and he knows a great deal about the competitive evaluation process because he wrote the framework for it, he's in a great position to offer a competitive bid of $4.477 million to provide commercial services for the CEP. The CEP will last a little more than a year, about 15 months. And he wins that contract. So good for him. Rear Admiral Rowan Moffat served his country honorably, uh, retired from the Navy, got a great civilian defense contractor position and made a great deal for EY, which I'm sure he shared in the reward with. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. That's not illegal or anything. The man who took his place, though, in 2014, actually, he started in September 2013, but there was a little bit of a few months of turnover there at the end of the year, is Rear Admiral Gregory Samut. And I hope I'm saying his last name right, Samut. Uh, he qualified submarines in 1991. His career and my naval career parallel each other in a lot of different ways, uh, well, especially the timeline is. Uh, but instead of getting out of the Navy, he uh, stayed in the Navy in 2013, took over as head of Future Submarine Program. Uh, from Rear Admiral Moffat. Uh, he eventually retired in 2020. And instead of going to work for a defense contractor, he went back to work for the government in their auditing department, which in 2020 has been uh, renamed from Defensive Material Organization to um, Capability and Acquisitions and Sustainment Group, CASG. So he stayed in federal service, but on the civilian side of it. So a very honorable man. I should mention also he was appointed as an officer of the Order of Australia, which is a huge honor for uh, anyone in the military uh, for, for Australia. And he did retire from that in 2020. So two stories of two admirals involved in this program up to 2020 uh, that end up with taking two different routes. Uh, but I would just mention uh, Rear Admiral Gregory Summit here just because I have an immense amount of respect for him. And he and I share some of our uh, at sea experiences during the same decades. All right, 2013 and 2014, we're gonna talk about Japan's gambit. Japan, uh, Prime Minister Abe from Japan and Prime Minister Abbott from Australia appear to get along quite well personally uh, and professionally. So uh, Prime Minister Abbott from Australia uh, visits, visits Japan quite often. And during these visits, uh, things like the future submarine program are discussed. So I've outlined here uh, the chronological order of events in Australia and how Japan uh, was unofficially involved in getting um, this, this contract, possibly getting this contract. In May 2013, Australia finally confirms publicly that it is not going to buy fewer than 12 submarines to save money. They're going to get 12 future submarines. That's not going to change after May 2013. September 2013, a formal review of the South Australian shipyard begins. They This is part of uh, Rear Admiral Moffat's inspection of, you know, what do we need so that we know how we can get what we're going to have in the future. They inspect the shipyard. Well, that report comes back in April 2014 a review of the shipyard has shown improvement since 2009 where only two Collins submarines were operational. And I have one source that says only one was operational in 2009, but now in 2014, two or three Collins submarines are operational 90% of the time out of the fleet of six um, that, 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 that were built. They only two or three are operational now. But it's still an improvement from 2009. In June 2014, defense technology sharing agreement is signed between Japan and Australia. This is the first formal agreement uh, talking about defense technology sharing and trading uh, Japan has signed ever. They just made this legal in Japan. And the first agreement they make it with is Australia. So things are looking really well that there's this future submarine program in Australia and Japan is 
signing defense technology agreements already with, with, with Australia. The next month, July 2014, they signed an agreement to initiate future defense cooperation, including the purchase of submarines. June and July of 2014 are watershed moments in Japan. It looks like negotiations for the future submarine program have begun, even though there hasn't been any kind of evaluation process begun at all. The political agreements are being made, and this is how contracts get written they a lot of times begin over a dinner table between uh, defense industry leaders or world leaders, or sometimes it's on trips like this abroad and where these topics come up and they end in these signed agreements that pave the way for future lucrative contracts. In August, 2014, Japanese submarine experts tour the Osborne Naval Shipyard. That's the place where Australia expects to build the next 12 submarines for them. The problem with this visit is that the State Department of South Australia was not informed before the arrival. It was uh, coordinated informally at the federal level, at the prime minister level. And so whenever the dignitaries or the, the experts showed up, they were not expected. The shipyard was not prepared. It did not go well, but it did happen. Uh, October 2014, the Defense Minister Johnson asks Japan's Defense Minister, this is one Defense Minister to another Defense Minister, to help build our future submarines. So there, this is not just at the Prime Minister level now, this is now getting down into the staff, are making verbal agreements, asking for help, will you come on board our future submarine program? Part of the submarine deal with Japan could include oil drill drilling rights, off the coast of Australia. And this caused a big concern in uh, the political circles and public circles of, uh, of, of Australia because nobody wanted that to happen except the people that wanted Japan's help for building a submarine. Of course, Japan wanted the oil. So all that's going on in 2014, Japan has a huge head start above anybody else in getting involved in future submarine. So here's what Japan has to offer. Again, this is not an official bid or anything, but here's what Japan is building at the time. And they just commissioned one of these submarines as of 2020, the Soryu class SSK. And this is an extremely capable submarine. It's really good. It's a long range submarine. So it meets the long range requirements that uh, are needed for Australia because of their geographical location in the world and where the base is at the bottom end of the, the continent. It is air independent drive. And it's not only just air independent, because air independent has been something that's been around for decades now, but it's air independent with the latest technology called energy cells. These energy cells store an enormous amount of energy that the submarine can use over a period of measured in weeks instead of days now, and includes high speed discharge, which means they can um, go very fast. Like early technology, air independent drives were limited in speed just because they couldn't push the energy to the motor fast enough. Whether it was the Mesma drive or another drive, it didn't matter. The uh, Sterling drive, those were all very low speed air independent drives. Well, the energy cells are a whole new generation of AIP. They can go slow and quiet for long periods of time. They can also go very fast for relatively long periods of time, days. And they, you know, evade torpedoes when they need to. So they, an air, an energy cell AIP submarine has a lot of the benefits of a nuclear submarine in terms of speed, tactical positioning and evasion with the benefits of a diesel boat in being quiet and not needing that nuclear maintenance that is super expensive and requires a civilian industry to support it. And there's a lot to it. So you kind of have the best of both worlds when your SSK has energy cells. You put those together, you got a good submarine. So Japan is building these for themselves at a cost of about $600 million a copy. Presumably they would sell them for above that cost. And that cost could be anywhere from 800 to 900 million dollars uh, a unit, okay? And these are all just estimates because this ended up not even happening. But here's where Japan drops the ball. Japan, uh, one, doesn't wanna build these submarines anywhere but where they're building them now because they're already set up to build them. They're pumping them out now. Let's just build some extras for you guys, right? They don't want to build them in Australia. They don't want to export the technology to Australia other than to how to maintain it. But the actual construction of it, they're going to do themselves. This uh, is 
a very inexperienced perspective. Again, Japan is brand new to the military industrial scene internationally. This is the first time they've offered any kind of technology. They don't know that whenever you offer your technology to be sold to another country, whether it's Pakistan, India, and in this case, Australia, all those other countries who have done it in the past have built their own infrastructure up to eventually build more capable submarines based on your deal. Well, Japan, for whatever reason, doesn't know that. And so they say, hey, we're going to build them for you and then we'll help you maintain them. Okay, Japan industry could not support both its domestic demand at 2020, the year of this recording, and Australian orders. So what they would have to do is increase their industrial capability, essentially improving their own infrastructure, what Australia is trying to do at the same time, to meet the increased demand. They're not prepared for that uh, in 2014. Also, one of the requirements of future sub is to have regional superiority uh, among other submarines, right? They need to have the best submarine in their region. And if they buy a submarine from another country, that's, you know, not necessarily in their region, but in the same ocean, (laughs) Pacific Ocean, they would only have regional parity with Japan. But and a good argument could be made that Japan's far enough away that it's not in the region. and uh, But all that doesn't matter because they ended up not going with it. And here's how that happened. 2014, Sean Costello comes back. He's the guy that wrote How to Buy a Submarine. Remember that? 2009. He, in 2014, is the chief of staff and advisor to Defense Minister David Johnston. David Johnston just requested the Japanese prime minister, help us build submarines because we're not good at it. We don't do it very well. We barely have... Two out of the six we built that work anymore. Uh, we need we need your assistance, Japan. Well, in November 2014, Defense Minister Johnston reported to the Senate, and there he is on the floor of the Senate during a debate that the Australian Submarine Corporation are uh, was at least 350 million over budget in building the three AW uh, destroyers that they had built before. The Defense Minister stated that he would not trust. ASC to build a canoe, much less a future sub. That's why we should be looking at Japan, who is building a great submarine right now and wants to sell us some. You know, why don't we take advantage of that? It'll save, oh my God, the the taxpayer savings, if they had simply bought the, the submarines from Japan, would have been immense. They could have got them for a fraction of the cost. But because they want to build them themselves, there's a lot of inherent cost in that. And Defense Minister David Johnston is essentially trying to make that point, but he's doing it in a very brash way that offends a lot of people. It also offends a lot of people in his own department. Remember, as these defense ministers are appointed, a lot of times their staff are holdovers from previous administrations. They don't always you know, wipe out the staff, especially the lower level staff, the people, the secretaries, the ones that are opening the mail and taking care of the day-to-day activities. A lot of those people stay on because it's their career. No matter who the defense minister is, they're they're still the staffers. So some of these staffers that have access to behind the scenes things like restaurant receipts for dinners with foreign dignitaries and defense industry leaders from November, uh, they leak intentionally those receipts to the media, the Australian media. And it blows up. Apparently, he spent over $6,000 in the month of November on four dinners with, you know, maybe 30 people uh, over that time frame. And it's uh, just an unexcusable use uh, of taxpayer funds, even though that's kind of how deals get made. So, of course, David Johnson resigns immediately. And the writing was on the wall that he wasn't going to be the defense minister in 2015 anyway, because there was a lot of political upheaval between 2015 and 2014. So he was already on his way out the door, which is probably why he was being brash on the Senate floor saying a SC couldn't build a canoe. And his advisor, Sean Castello, chief of staff, left with him. A real quick sidebar. Here are the receipts I'm talking about. They total over $6,000, Australian dollars, uh, for the month of November over four dinners at Matilda Bay Restaurant, Sean's Kitchen, and Balthazar's Restaurant, uh, which presumably are high-end ref- restaurants, to, you know, looking at these right receipts here. Um, I would like to make a side note that this is how business gets done. A lot of times this is just the cost of doing business, but it is easy to see how taxpayers who are struggling to 
feed their own family in a lot of cases, especially in the global depression that we're all coming out of in 2014, 2015. Uh, how can these you know, defense ministers be spending all this money on these dinners? And so I completely understand how this looks and why he resigned. Uh, and he did too, which is why he high resigned. But I'm here to tell you folks, as a former military person myself, who is now in the defense industry myself, these dinners happen and they cost a lot of money, but a lot of good comes from them. A lot of big contracts, the, no the negotiation process is streamlined over these dinners that happen beforehand. And they're not always dinners, but you know, informal meetings where there's no lawyers, it's just the principals and they're talking about what they want and how the other one can give them what they want and what it might cost before any accountants and lawyers get involved. So this is an important part of the process and it is optically unfavorable. 2015, Sean just resigned. He needs a new job and DCNS is there to pick him up. DCNS, also known as Naval Group now, is the leading uh, French uh, military contractor that builds submarines and ships and other things around the globe for all sorts of different countries like Pakistan. They just recently uh, supplied Pakistan with three Augusta B, Augusta B diesel boat submarines. So they had just done something like this re recently, a few decades ago in Pakistan. And so they have some experience with providing countries with conventionally powered submarines, you know, at, at a price. And Sean Costello, who wrote the paper of how to buy a submarine back in 2009, has worked in the Australian circles for years now and knows the competitive evaluation process framework because he was there with the defense minister as the chief of staff while all that was going on. He has great inside information and he's a free agent folks as of 2015 because he was not elected. He's not an elected official, so he doesn't have to wait 12 months to abide by the antitrust laws or the uh, anti-competitive laws, the, the, the corruption laws uh, that elected leaders or military um, senior officials would have to abide by. He is a civilian through and through and has been for a long time, even though he was appointed chief of staff and he can legally go work for anybody he wants to in January, 2015, one month after he uh, resigned. And he does, he gets picked up in what I consider the deal of the century by DCNS. In an interview years after this happened, uh, Costello remarked that he was surprised that Japan did not hire him because Japan was the heir apparent for the future submarine program. Everything was looking like it was going Japan's direction. And had Japan simply called him to say, hey, facilitate the deal for us, head the bid for us in the negotiations, come on our side, Japan would have probably got the contract. Costello even says that. But DCNS called first. DCNS stole the most valuable man on the negotiation team to the French. And now the French have the negotiation advantage because of Mr. Castillo's insight. So he will work with Joel Branchant. Branchant is the former attache who was involved in the Pakistan Agosta B deal. So Joel has a lot of experience uh, in negotiating these deals as he did with Pakistan. Now, the Pakistan deal went sideways because back in the 1990s under French law, uh, French contractors for negotiation purposes could pay money call, that they called commissions, but were in action bribes. They could literally bribe people to win contracts. That was legal in France in the 90s. Now, since then, they've changed the laws. That's no longer legal. Um, but that blew up into a big thing because they were bribing people in Lebanon, Spain, and Pakistan, some of that money made its way back into France into a re-election fund that got exposed. And they made that illegal after that, which stopped the payments to Pakistan. Uh, as a result of that, some terrorist attacks were launched against the French submarine engineers that were working in that country uh, at that time to help them build their submarines. And about 14 people died. So it was a huge deal of corruption, bribery, and terrorism. Anyway, so that gentleman who did that is going to be working with Sean on the French side of the negotiation table to try and get these uh, deals made. Costello uh, brings his knowledge, says, hey, there's 12 things, 12 tasks we got to do. And the first one of these is brilliant. He says, hey, we got to bring on a U.S. defense industry. Why do we got to do that, Sean? That's going to be expensive, Sean. I don't think that's a good idea, Sean. We have our own, 
you know, defense industry here in France. Why do we need to involve the Americans? Why, why make this more complicated? The reason for that is the United States was quietly with a nodding approval across the Pacific Ocean, uh, encouraging Japan and Australia to come to terms over the Soyuz submarine deal. Not because Soyuz submarine is one of the best diesel boat submarines made in the 21st century, and it is. It's because we want a good, strong relationship that surrounds China. The United States wants Japan, a strong Japan, north of China, east of Korea. We want a strong Australia that's south of China, watching the South China Sea and the approaches from, from the Indian Ocean. And we want these two countries to have a strategic partnership together. It would make the Pacific Rim more stable. And there would be somebody to help butt the expansion that China is seeing right now in that region. And you know, so the United States wanted this alliance to work. So he says, hey, in order to get you know, the United States approval on our side, you know, let's get a US industry involved here. And they uh, choose Lockheed Martin. They asked Lockheed Martin to make the fire control system, basically bring the fire contr control system, the BYG-1 that's used on modern submarines now, uh, and incorporate it into the future submarine design. And they begin working on that. He also says, hey, Australia needs new infrastructure in the shipyard. The ASC shipyard, you know, is barely maintaining a couple Collins boats right now. We need new facilities, a new assembly building, a new common building, uh, you know, slips. You know, a lot of work has got to get done in uh, Adelaide, you know, the Osborne shipyard. And they're like, all right, we're going to include that in the deal. You know, the, the, this deal starting to get expensive. It was $36 billion. It's going to be $50 billion in large part of all these additional fees that are being added in here. And infrastructure is a big part of it. Also, we have to train the Australian workforce. The Australian workforce hasn't built a submarine in decades and can barely maintain a submarine right now. So we need to, you know, re-equip them with the tools that they need and the knowledge to use them. That's going to take money and time. So again, the cost is going up now. And in 2015, in constant dollars, in 2015 dollars, if nothing changes, if time stood still, it would be $50 billion. But time doesn't stand still. And this cost is only going to go up. The competitive evaluation process uh, begins in 2015, officially begins in February 2015. And after two years of talks with Japan, uh, they include France and Germany, uh, Thyssen Krupp Marine Systems, to a conference in March. Uh, Japan does not attend this conference. So what is Japan doing instead of attending this conference? This is a big question that I um, had while, while writing this. And it looks like President or Prime Minister, rather, Prime Minister Abe is talking to Mitsubishi and Kawasaki Industries on how they can increase their industrial capacity to meet the demand of the Australian contract. Even though they don't have the Australian contract in writing, President Abe is convinced because of his two years of talks with Australia as prime minister, he is absolutely convinced that he's got this deal done in everything but in writing. And he needs to begin working on preparing his country to meet the needs of Australia. Well, this is a fatal flaw because they do not have the contract. They have all the goodwill in the world. They have two years of history together. They've signed technological agreements. They've had defense ministers ask, ask each other for help. They've had everything except the important part, the contract. And they don't show up to the contract bidding um, conferences. There's one in March. There's another one in July. They don't go to either one. Uh, during these conferences, Naval Group is the only one that says that we will build every submarine in Australia. The Germans say, hey, we can save you a lot of money, the majority of the contract cost, if we build the submarines in Germany and bring them to you. And they're right. That's what Japan's offering too. It saves Australia an enormous amount of money. But Australia, this is not a submarine deal anymore. This has become uh, an infrastructure project and an education project, a workforce development project that also accumulates in the construction of 12 submarines. There are many parts to this contract that have little to do with the actual building of the submarine. It's the future maintaining of it and the technology involved in it and the training. And Japan and Germany uh, fail to understand that. And the only reason why France understands it as well as they do is they have Sean. 
2015-2016, uh, the competitive value evaluation is underway during uh, this time. It is a 15-month process, and to ensure that the competitive evaluation process remains competitive and evaluational, <laughs> they assign an oversight committee of four people to this. First person on this is Professor Donald Winter, who is a former Secretary of the United States Navy. Very honorable man, honorable position, served well. Um, but Donald Winter in the past had supported the DCNS uh, proposal over any other one. So by adding Donald Winter to the advisory oversight panel makes it appear as if we want the competitive evaluation process to be leaning in the direction of France, in the direction of Naval Group, right? Now, they, that may not be what's actually happening, but those are what the appearances are. I believe uh, Professor Donald Winter, Secretary Donald Winter, uh, is, is a fine man and probably did a great objectionable job, you know, or evaluated, you know, did, did a fair evaluation is my point, but it doesn't appear that way because of his comments before he was appointed. Uh, the second member is Ju the Honorable Julie Streeton, who's a former justice of Federal Court of Australia. So she's coming at it from the federal law lawyer side of things. Uh, Mr. Ron Finley is an infrastructure specialist because this is very much an infrastructure contract at this point. And Mr. Jim McDowell is the defense expert for following uh, the defensive side of things, make sure things are there. Together, these four people do a great job despite the appearances of bias by Mr. Donald Winter. Uh, they reported to the Australian National Audit Office, ANAO, uh, who's responsible for auditing this entire process uh, on 13 April, 2016. In their report, they say uh, the competitive evaluation process was sound and appropriate. The accountability is very sound and defensible. So there's people accountable for each step along the way. Each participant being France, uh, Germany and Japan. Oh, and I should mention they briefly looked at Sweden because of the Gotland class, uh, but Sweden didn't have uh, their, their act together a good proposal, so they quickly dismissed Sweden. They also approached the United States and the UK briefly, um, but because they wanted to build nuclear submarines and that's not what Australia does, uh, they were not seriously considered. So really there's just three countries that were each uh, treated fairly and equitably. Uh, the design phase the one negative thing that the expert advisory oversight panel got right, and this was damning, and I wish they had paid more attention to this, but a lot of the stuff gets buried under a lot of legal jargon. But in this report, um, they say the design phase, which is the first phase, removes competition and incentive for following phases. In other words, once we contract the primary contractor, whether it's Japan, Germany, or France, with the design of the submarine, we are no longer talking to any other participants, which gives the winner of the design phase a monopoly on future negotiations. A layman can see how that is going to be detrimental to the cost of the program. Whenever you have one company whose incentive is profit to provide a service to a country who has to either pay the price or not, and there's no other choice. They've limited their options. Australia, after the design phase, is negotiating price from a position of weakness. And you never want to be at a negotiation where you're talking or negotiating from a position of weakness. Um, that's just one of the basic rules of negotiation. And they've already set themselves up. France didn't do this to them. They, Australia did this to themselves with their own process that was being written by the Rear Admiral Moffat from 2009 to 2014. This is a flaw in his design. 2015-2016, competitive evaluation process, 15-month period, expected to cost about $30 million. There are five pillars of the competitive evaluation process. They want a product that is regionally superior, regionally superior, conventionally powered submarine. Cost must be a factor. We want to spend as much money as it takes to get this product and not a dime more. A delivery schedule. We must have a delivery schedule so that we can hold the contractor to milestones. The Australian industry is very important to us. The fourth pillar of the CEP process is that the Australian industry must build these submarines from the ground up. They'll all be built in the Osborne Naval Shipyard near Adelaide in South Australia. 
And then finally, we need to evaluate the risk. What is the risk that these other four pillars will not be made? All right, so that's that's the CP process in a nutshell. That's what they're doing. So in March, they have that first conference I told you about that Japan did not attend. France and Germany did. France, France submits its proposal with Sean based on his framework. It says, hey, we'll build a submarine here for you. We'll build you 12 of them. It's going to cost $50 million in a constant uh, dollars or up to as much as it could be $80 billion um, in, in, in outturn dollars. And that's to take into account inflation, uh, international exchange rates uh, over the next 30 years, you know, because we don't know, but we know that's not going to get cheaper. It's going to go up. So somewhere between 50 and $80 billion could be as much as $80 billion. Germany says, hey, we could save you all that money. You don't even need to pay that much money. It wouldn't be a half that if you let us build, build us the submarines in Germany and we'll just put them on a barge and send them down to you. But that doesn't meet the Australian industry goal, does it? It certainly meets the cost and it could meet the regionally superior submarine possibly, but it completely ignores one of the pillars of the competitive evaluation process of in Australian industry being involved in the process. So Germany does not win the bet. They have another one of these conferences in the summertime uh, where the same sides basically repeat themselves with some refined submissions, but nothing much has changed. And in April 2016, now this is the following year, uh, Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, which is a new government. This is not the same um, prime minister that's been visiting Japan for a couple of years, making promises and signing deals. This is a new gentleman, new government. And he wants to go in a new direction than the previous government went. That's just politics. It just makes sense. He's not going to repeat what the last people, the previous party was doing because why would they need him? They should have just kept the previous party, right? So he wants to go in a new direction. He announces that France is the preferred design partner. And that's huge. That locks it in for France. Germany and Japan can go pack bags now because once the design partner is agreed upon, we're moving forward only with that design partner for everything else. It's a monopoly for France now. This is the problem in the process that was never corrected. And now going forward after April, 2016, guess who has the monopoly and guess who has the cash and guess which direction that's going to go. They say that this project will cost $50 billion in constant dollars at the time. That's how this project is being sold to the Australian public, which is a disservice because everybody involved in the process knows that that does not account for inflation. It's not an outturned value. The real value is $80 billion. And I think this process would have been a lot better if the Australian government, the Turnbull government had just stated that right away. But it appears from everything that I've read that they downplayed the cost of this program to the public as $50 billion in 2016. And that will come back to haunt them when it starts coming time to write checks, which is coming up pretty soon. DCNS, now Naval Group, will be the primary contractor. The design's name is Shortfin Barracuda Block 1A. This is a brand new submarine that uses the Barracuda nuclear submarine as a baseline only. This is another point of contention and misinformation I found on the internet. This is not the nuclear Barracuda with its nuclear power plant removed. It is much more complicated than that. This is the Barracuda baseline design. Imagine the shell of the submarine where they completely rebuild uh, the parts inside of it. And that determines how long and wide the submarine is going to be. So it's a very different design that incorporates new technologies not used in the Barracuda. Like the Lockheed Martin BYG-1 fire control system for one. There's going to be a new power plant. It's going to be a conventional diesel power plant. They're going to have an electric motor. They promise, even though France doesn't have this at the time, that they're going to try and put energy cells in it. And I'm telling you folks, energy cells is a deal breaker. If you want a regionally superior submarine anywhere in the world right now, you better have energy cells in it. Con conventional conversion of the nuclear Barracuda SSN is how this is sold to the public. Just for simplicity, I understand why they did that, but it's not the truth. And so when people start looking at why is this so expensive, why are we paying more for this submarine than they are for the nuclear version of it? I understand why questions like that come up. And that's because your government 
talked down to you in simplified terms on the Australian side of things. And it caused confusion. And that confusion led to frustration over the cost of this program. September 2016, checks are being written. One of the first one is $500 million to the design and mobilization phase of the contract issued to Naval Group. Uh, construction of facilities at Adelaide's Osborne uh, North Submarine Facility begin. They also built some new buildings on the south side of the facility. It doesn't matter. It's all the same facility. Um, and they've, they're locked into France is going to build 12 submarines. So Australia knew that it wanted 12 submarines years ago. They're now contractually obligated to design uh, a future sub and build 12 of them and begin the infrastructure um, part of the mobilization to build these submarines in South Australia. A $148 million contract is agreed upon, but not signed yet with Lockheed Martin to provide the fire control combat system. A quick note about combat system and fire control system. Uh, combat system is the common name for co uh, modern fire control systems around the world because they integrate sonar, communications, and weapons control all into the same network. And it's just commonly called combat system. On the American side of things, we still call it a fire control system because back in the day, all these other systems like my sonar system would have to have a special converter uh, to talk to the fire control system. And then the radio was its own thing. Uh, they weren't all linked together. But even in the United States Navy, the today's combat systems is basically one big network. So it's called the combat uh, system and because it integrates more than just the fire control. All right, sidebar completed. November, 2017, a whole year goes by, okay? The whole year of 2017 basically passes where they're building infrastructure uh, and buildings in Osborne um, Naval Shipyard. Money's being spent, industry is being produced. You know, wheels are actually beginning to turn in 2017. Now, negotiations for the strategic partnering agreement, which is a big part of this deal between France and Australia, they begin during this time. There's a technology transfer agreement that's made that comes along with buying the submarine and the intellectual property. The technology transfer agreement is often used whenever uh, nuclear technology is transferred from one nation to another, like Russia to India. That happened with their nuclear submarine program. Uh, in this case, it's happening with a conventional submarine program because this conventional submarine is so advanced. It has a very good weapon system. There are a lot of really good systems on this submarine. So they have a technology transfer agreement. Building new facilities in Adelaide's has created approximately 600 jobs. And so the government is trying to show, hey, this is what we're getting for our money. You know, we're training people, we're building facilities, all these new jobs. This is an investment project as much as it is a military contract with Naval Group. January 2018, the next year, just a couple months after this, Lockheed Martin integration contract is finally signed. They're going to integrate the combat uh, system into the program. Uh, funding research programs at the University of now New South Wales are funded as well. So not only are they training shipyard workers, but they're training the university students in the art and science of naval architecture and other things, physics and whatnot. Uh, net, net, network engineering, that's a big part of it because everything's on a network now. So they have multiple training programs you know, in and around the South Australian area. The money's not just going to the shipyard, is my point. It's supporting businesses and university. Okay, Australian National Audit Office uh, confirms the total of $80 billion in outturn dollars uh, for the future submarine program till 2080. So this program is going to be constructed, um, well, it's already in this design phase, but the submarines will be constructed from 2020s to 2050s. And those submarines will be in service until 2080. And in that year, 2080, we estimate that uh, it'll be about $80 billion. Now, this is a really oversimplified and underestimated um, number because Naval Group is telling defense, you know, during the contract negotiations that the $80 billion outturn dollars is just over the next 30 years just over the construction of the program, not the lifetime of the program. So here is another moment where the Australian government misrepresents the value and cost of this program to the Australian people. 
which again causes frustration whenever they begin to realize how expensive this is going to be. All right, so here's the Osborne Naval Shipyard. I thought you might take a look at it. This is the home of the Collins class submarines construction and maintenance. Uh, this is where they will, will be building the attack class submarine. Attack class is the name of the new class of submarine uh, Australia's building. Uh, they're also building the hunter class frigates here. Uh, they've built three war uh, air warfare destroyers here and offshore patrol vessels were built here. It's a very busy shipyard. Uh, in my opinion is quite capable, even though they've struggled with maintenance with the Collins class. Uh, they have a naval ship building college here, which requires some explanation because I didn't understand this either. Uh, they don't actually teach anything at this college. This is simply a department in the shipyard that looks at what skills the shipyard workers will need to build projects today and in the future. So it's more of an evaluation department than anything, but it's called a college. Uh, future home of Naval Headquarters in South Australia. Uh, I guess right now they're in like a temporary situation at a, uh, at a barracks. And eventually once the facilities here are finished, uh, Naval Headquarters will also be based out of the shipyard. On the right, you can see a picture of, of a satellite view of the new facilities that they're building. Uh, it looks like they've got plenty of room to build a few more there. But those are just some of the buildings that they've built as of now, as of the time of this recording. Okay, the Auditor General Report number 22, design phase delays. So we signed the contract for the design phase, right? But the design phase, as of now, is nine months behind, running behind schedule. So defense cannot demonstrate or show a product for what their $396 million has bought until this phase is complete. Because until the design phase is done, we don't have anything to show. We don't, we don't have the design, basically. So a delay, to give you the big picture, a delay of three years over the next 30 years, the construction of the submarine, will cause a defensive gap between the Collins-class submarines retiring from service and the future submarines being operational and in a effective rotation where you have one deployed, one in refit, one in training. And that's kind of the cycle where you always need, if you build one ship, you might as well build three because there's a rotation to it. And that's why they went with 12. So they have some options in the future. So they've already used up nine months of their three-year window, their three-year overlap before there's a defensive vulnerability in Australia's sea defense, at least from the submarine perspective. Uh, design milestones are not met yet. Uh, defense will allow additional time for Naval Group to meet the high level of design requirements because what other choice do they have? We've negotiated away the competition. Do you begin to understand what a devastating process decision that was? At this point, we can't go back to Japan and be like, you know what? Let me get a couple of your submarines while we fill this gap. We can't do that anymore. So Naval Group, understanding this, hires ECG Advisories, which is a registered lobbyist company with a lobbyist at the helm to come in and mediate the negotiations. They're brought in to keep the deal alive in 2018. Design deadlines are extended until 2019, or then they'll also look at system requirements, which have been extended now out to December, 2019, the end of the year, and systems functional review, which was gonna happen in 2020, is now in 2021. So the whole program has been pushed back approximately nine months on each one of these milestones. So who are these deal makers? Who did Naval Group bring in? All right, so this is ECG Advisory Solutions here and their sister company, ECG Financial. I include their sister company because ECG Advisory Solutions is a registered lobbyist, lobby company. Uh, they talk to politicians, they pay politicians, they support political campaigns. And because they do that, they have to be registered. EGC Financial is not. They are a financial company helmed by Peter Costello, who's the former federal treasurer uh, for Australia. So here's an apparent conflict of interest because Peter Costello is on the board for ECG advisory, but he as an individual is not registered as a lobbyist. Whereas the head of ECG advisory who's involved in these negotiations, David Gazard is a registered lobbyist. 
So here you can see how choosing ECG advisories has a little bit of apparent conflict of interest with some people being lobbyists, working with some people that are not, trying to negotiate differences in a defense contract of enormous expense, enormous. This is a huge deal. The, the contract value is a huge deal. Okay, so design delays through the future submarine program schedule is what they're targeting. Uh, their talks for finalizing the strategic partnership agreement are at an impasse at this time. Naval Group contracts these gentlemen to come in and help mitigate that. Now, Peter Costello is a very smart man and he sees the apparent uh, inappropriateness of him being involved in the negotiations and he takes himself out of the picture. Um, he has a controlling share of ECG Financial and he uh, goes you know, away from these discussions and uh, runs ECG Financial. So he takes himself out of the picture and leaving David Gazard and Jonathan Epstein and whoever else might be on their staff to uh, continue negotiations. These are the deal makers. These are the people that help push the strategic partnership agreement at this time. Closing the deal, ECG Advisory steps in. This is a lobbying firm founded by uh, David Gazard, liberal party politician. He's a confidant and close friend of the current Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who is on, uh, you know, just by de facto head of the, um, of the Australian side of the negotiations. Naval Group started, uh, stated rather that Mr. Gazard helped finalize the deal after difficulty, after difficult negotiations between both parties. In December, this is the big thing. In December, 2018, Australia declares negotiations concluded. They will sign the strategic partnering agreement despite the delays with France. Because again, what was the other option? Start over? You're 10 years into this deal. You're still building skiffs and infrastructure and you've spent billions of dollars. You, do, do, do you throw that all away over a nine month delay? Well, they chose not to throw it away and sign the deal. Again, negotiating from a position of weakness. This was not a hard deal to make. If you look at it from the Naval Group point of view, they're holding all the cards there on the left. Who's running that deal? It's our good friend, Sean Costello. He's the guy that you know, reached out to ECG to, to hire them. These guys are good friends. The lobbyists of ECG and the prime minister know each other on a personal level and have worked with each other for years. And so they agree to the 80 billion outturn dollar strategic partnership agreement. This agreement is verbally confirmed in December, 2018, and is finally signed into legal agreement 11 February, 2009. So let's real quick review the pillars of the competitive evaluation process and see if we accomplished them. Regional superior submarine at the cost that it takes, not a penny more. We want a fixed schedule. We want to include Australian industry in every aspect, evaluate our risk of the four other things not happening. Well, the design is finished as of 2019. By the time they got this uh, agreement signed, Naval Group claimed the design was finished. Defense claimed the design is also finished, but it's secret, so they can't show anybody. So we just have to take their word for it, which I do. Honestly, I do. I believe it is finished. The project is a cost estimated at $80 billion for the life of the project. Uh, the Australians still told the public that that was till 2080. It's not. It's only during the construction phase to about 2050. Uh, that's going to have to be resolved at some point in the future because um, this 80 billion outturn dollars is only for the next 30 years to 2050. It's not for the entire life of the submarine. That's a different value. Okay, the first kill is going to be laid in 2024. That was recently delayed from 2023. Uh, again, keeps getting pushed back. Uh, with the scheduling delays that we're seeing now, that scheduling delay right there doesn't include the nine months. That's that's a, that's another delay. There's probably going to be a strategic gap between the Collins class and the future submarine. And there's proposals right now to extend the Collins class life to try and cover the gap. The first delivery date of the next submarine of the future submarine is 2032. We got to keep the Collinses operational, uh, at least three of them to have a proper rotation until 2032. And that's a different sub brief. That's uh, they're, they're, they're trying to do that right now in conjunction with doing this deal. 
Australian industry, industry involvement uh, has a budget of about $900 million. That's for local businesses to supply support, whether it's parts uh, or a food truck, just anything that supports the shipyard. That bucket of money is estimated to be about $900 million of this whole contract. Sustainment cost uh, till 2080 is estimated to be $145 billion outturn dollars. But that is so far in the future and so much can change between now and 2080. That number really means nothing. But I think they're just trying to give you the idea of what it might cost uh, if everything goes as expected, which has not happened at all. Uh, because of all these things, risk is high. It is extreme due to delays and cost overruns. Here is the plan right now. This comes from the ANAO auditing website. Uh, this incorporates the delays that we know of out up until now. Uh, the construction phase, most important part of this will begin in uh, 2024, which pushes the op and test evaluation out to about 2032, where the submarine will then come into service, barring any future delays. All right, so how do they compare to the Collins class? Well, the Collins class was a lot smaller than any of the current submarines. The, the Soryu, the Type 216, uh, each around you know 4,000 tons. The conventional Barracuda is estimated to be at about 4,700, I'm sorry, 4,700 tons. It is about 100 meters in length and 8.8 .8 meters in width. Um, according to Naval Group, it will make 20 knots submerged, and that is entirely, the, uh, well, 20 knots is, probable, but if they have fuel cells, they can definitely exceed that. Uh, fuel cells are promised. Uh, they are not guaranteed. Uh, they are under development right now by Naval Group. Naval Group swears that they will have them ready uh, during the construction phase, uh, but time will tell. We don't know. This is going to happen over the next 10 years. So um, I'll be making another sub brief in uh, 2024 uh, covering things like, did the fuel cells ever get created? Because I I find it suspect that uh, they're not ready now, but you know maybe they need to be developed some more. Uh, there's also some, this, this, this chart was created by Naval Group. So towards the bottom, they have a lot of their own French weapon systems like the F-21 heavy torpedo, the Exocet anti-ship cruise missile, the Scalp land attack missile. Yeah, none of those are happening. No, we have an American fire control system on this submarine. It's gonna be shooting American weapons like the ADCAP Mod 7, uh, the UGM-84 Harpoon anti-ship missile. Uh, those are definitely going to be in the attack class specifications. So this is a very preliminary early look at what the conventional Barracuda may look like in 10 years. Uh, we will compare and contrast this with the actual product that Australia gets delivered when that happens. All right, so 2020, let's look at Australia today. Your prime minister is Scott Morrison. If you don't know that, you should. Australian. And your defense minister is the Honorable Linda Reynolds. The deal, uh, as of November 2020, time of this recording, uh, you're in a strategic partnership with Naval Group. Uh, you've given them an additional $605 million to cover the cost of expenses. Uh, that includes the money for the fire control system that went to Lockheed Martin is, is in that pile. You have $900 million for local Australian businesses. So that looks really good. Look at this. You got more money for the Australian businesses than you've given Naval Group so far. But that 900 million is for, you know, now, you know, it's for the whole program. Australian Naval Infrastructure and Expansion Osborne Naval Shipyard is underway. Uh, you're, you're seeing a lot of bang for your buck right now there. A lot of the money that you're spending is being right reinvested into shipyard worker paychecks. So this is definitely an investment program. This is not money lost. This is money invested. And then the final sub, the 12th submarine of the attack class will be delivered in 2054. That's the plan right now. Naval Group has recently, and this was an addition I found at the last minute, in March 2020, just a few months ago, Naval Group reduced its pledge to involve Australian industry involvement in the construction uh, of the submarine from an estimated 90% to about 60%. And that does not matter 
because neither the 90% nor the current 60% was ever written into the strategic partnership or the design and mobilization agreement as a legal milestone. So this is all lip service, really. They could come back tomorrow and say, guess what? It's 10% now. It's still not legally binding unless they create a new contract stating that we need to maintain a 90% Australian industry involvement. This is changing the deal after the agreement because you didn't make a good agreement the first time around. They never locked in Naval Group to committing to a firm number of how much Australian industry would be involved. It was discussed. The number 90% came up often. They didn't make it legally binding. Freedom of Information Act requests. God, I do love me a good conspiracy. So this is good. Um, Freedom of Information Act from uh, Chris Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Chris Douglas, for taking the time to do these time-consuming, painstaking requests. Uh, Freedom of Information is basically where you ask for uh, documents, whether they're government documents or otherwise, from a state agency like, I don't know, Australia, United States, China, uh, for a specific document that you want to read. And uh, they can redact the document as much as required and then offer you the document. That's what the Freedom of Information Act is about. And this is the Australian version of that act. A lot of countries have this, including the United States. Anyway, so he asks, Chris asks, for the anti-bribery and corruption program pertaining to the attack class submarine and future submarine project. Because of the wording of his request, and they're very picky about this, uh, the FOI officer uh, re responds with, no documents matching that description have been found. The Freedom of Information officer's reply later on in his response said, future submarine program and the Defense Audit and Fraud Control Division advise such a document does not exist. Now, how can that be when the anti-bribery and corruption plan is required in every defense contract, every federal contract, but especially defense contracts? So Chris says, well, that doesn't sound right. There certainly is because it's required by law. So he submits a second request, rephrasing the request for the freedom of information for the paperwork. He says this time, uh, I, I request the anti-bribery and corruption planning document. The planning document is required by law. So they can't turn him down based on the document doesn't exist anymore because if they did that, they would admit to be breaking the law. So they have to give him something this time. One document is found, of course, and it involves third parties. This is the Freedom of Information Officer's response. It involves third parties. Defense will consult with these third parties before relieving, re releasing the ABC plan. ABC stands for anti-bribery and corruption. Months later, in May 2020, defense has denied your freedom of information request because EY advised defense that the document would not be in the public interest and could harm the reputation of EY, a defense contractor. This is unacceptable. This is a defense contractor telling the Department of Defense or defense as it's known in Australia, that they cannot release a document that they're required by law to have in their agreement because it would make them look bad, because it would make them look corrupt. It would make them look as if they're being bribed. And if it makes them look as if they are, they probably are. And that is not in the public interest because that is going to raise hell over this deal. And Chris Douglas exposed this. Great job, Chris. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. The work of EY, this defense contractor, is being held from public criticism and review. Um, they're not releasing the anti-bribery and corruption plan because it would make them look bad. Whatever happened to Sean Costello? You remember him? The guy who wrote How to Buy a Submarine in 2009? I'll tell you, the last 10 years have been very good for Sean. I think we all can be very happy that Sean's doing very well now. If you remember, uh, Sean uh, headed the DCNS, now Naval Group, bid process to win the design and mobilization contract, essentially giving Naval Group a monopoly on future submarine project, right? Well, after, after he was doing that, he, he resigned from that position because they didn't need him anymore. He was there to do that one deal and he did it. And you know, I'm sure he was compensated handsomely. So he then moves over to become Italian-based shipbuilding companies, Finna Carteri's, Australia's office, 
CEO and heads the bid for C5000. C5000 is that project for the new uh, air warfare defense destroyer. And so he heads up that bid for the Italian based company, but he loses out on that one. He won the submarine bid back in 2016. He did not win the bid in 2019 for the ship. Uh, so he's betting 50% at this point. Uh, he resigns from his position after those negotiations uh, fail. And in 2020, as the time of this recording, he's returned to Naval Group, where he was successful, where he is now a comfortable vice president of international business development. So if there is a winner in this story, it's Naval Group. And the person who won the most was Sean. All right, final thoughts. Let me wrap this up with a little bow on top. How much a simple magazine article can net you? This Sean wrote how to buy a submarine for $36 billion in 2009. And it uh, turned into uh, quite a deal for him. Naval Group contracted former Australian political leaders uh, to, to negotiate terms against Australia. So I want to talk about interest. Who do you represent? So Sean Costello, uh, whenever he worked for ASC, obviously represented, you know, ASC. Whenever he worked as the chief of staff for the defense minister, he represented defense, you know, and, and advised them. But the moment he was hired onto Naval Group, he no longer represented the interest of the Australian people or defense or the Royal Australian Navy. Although he may feel close ties to those things, and he is Australian, he was representing France and Naval Group at the negotiations. He was representing their interest. And in financial terms, that's important to distinguish. And I've had some of my own researchers question my perspective on this. And because I'm a part of this type of deal and I see this, I want to make this clear to everybody else that whenever you're at a negotiation table, you're representing your party that you're there with, not who you were with before or your nationality or any kind of loyalty you may have. I'm sure he's a very loyal, you know, Australian, you know, former naval officer, very respected. But at the negotiation table, he represented France against the Australian taxpayer and he beat you like a drum. Approximately $3 billion have been spent up to this point. Uh, the embedded infrastructure cost of the agreement makes a per unit cost impossible for me to calculate because they're giving us the total outturn cost of about $80 billion over the construction life of the program, design and construction. But because they include all these other expenses like infrastructure and, you know, training, you can't just take the 80 billion and divide it by 12, you know? So the per construction cost is documented in a budget somewhere. It's itemized at some point, but that is not public. I don't have access to it. We don't know how much of these submarines are going to cost. My point is think back to the Japanese submarine. Japan is building their very advanced capable submarines for $600 million a copy. They would sell them even at an exorbitant price of say $1 billion a copy would save, you could have 80 of the Japanese submarines for what you're paying for 12 of this entire program. And I must remind you that the entire program is much more than submarines. But for the same amount of Australian dollars, you could have gotten a lot more. Instead, you got training and you got infrastructure. The first kill will be laid in 2024. The last tech submarine commissioning will be in 2054. 30 year construction project. It's gonna be approximately, like I said, $80 billion. Uh, if you take it through the life of the submarine itself out to 2080, uh, there's a wild number being thrown around of $145 billion, which we will not know if that's accurate until 2080, when we can look back and see uh, what the expense was. And by that point, it won't matter. The politicians who authorized this deal are out of office, by the way, with the exception of the prime minister. And you have Linda Reynolds, minister of defense, um, there's a few others in there, but I'm talking about the people that formed this, that put this together, the Rear, Rear Admiral Moffat. You know, he he was one of the first ones to bail on this. He set up the, the infrastructure and, and then retired and then profited from his knowledge, which is fine and legal, but he's no longer there. You can't throw him out of office anymore for what he's done to you. The military officers are all retired. The key negotiators are in new positions. Sean, he's he's back with Naval Group, but he's working with some international business department now that he's a vice president of. 
right? So in other words, you're not going to be able to hold the people who put Australia in this position accountable because they've already left. Australia is on a 30 year journey. Uh, the, key, the key players have left the bus. Uh, enjoy the ride, you know, because it's going to cost you $80 billion, maybe more. And you're going to end up with 12 very good submarines. Let's let's put that into perspective. The one thing that it, you, Australia did that was fantastic is they chose one of the best submarine construction contractors in the world. Naval Group is outstanding. They are amazing. You will get top of the line submarines from them. They better have fuel cells, but you're going to get a top of line submarine. Okay. But they're also one of the most contemptible, corrupt contractors in the nation to the point of they had to change French laws to keep them from paying bribes because it was legal in the 1990s. So they have that history. And these are the people that you're dealing with. And um, you've already signed away the contract. There's no getting that money back. That's my point. Uh, two constants do remain outside of your elective offices. Uh, you have ECG advisory, registered lobbyist, and you have EY defense contractor or EY defense. Um, I would keep an eye on those two companies if you are in Australia, if you're a citizen, if you're in politics down there, um, because those have not gone away. They'll be influencing future decisions, future contracts, and after what we've documented here, what they've done to the Australian taxpayer, I think it's worth a good, strong, hard look at how these companies and organizations spend your money and the influence they have over the transparency of the process. Remember, it's EY that told defense, hey, you can't release that ABC document, the anti-bribery and corruption document. Are you kidding me? It's going to make us look corrupt. So they didn't release it. Look at who's making the decision. Look at where the power is. It's not in your elected officials. I'll be doing a follow-up subbrief on this topic in 2024 or when they eventually lay the first keel, whether that's in 2025 or whether it happens at all.